A number of guests, duly introduced by fellows, beg leave to attend your meeting. Is it your pleasure that I welcome them in your name? Thank you very much. Minutes. Thank you and welcome everybody. The Society of Antiquaries London, Ordinary Meeting, Thursday 9th of November, 2023, at Burlington House and online. Professor Rosemary Sweet, Vice President and the Chair, the minutes of the Ordinary Meeting of Thursday, the 2nd of November, 2023, were read and signed. The following, being in attendance and having signed the obligation required by the statutes, were duly admitted fellows, Oliver Harris and Ollie Rowley Conway. The following communication was then laid before the society, remembering the destruction of the old bridge at Mostar 30 years on by Helen Wasilek. Thanks were returned for this communication. And the vice president announced that the next meeting would be on Thursday, 16th of November, 2023, and then adjourned the meeting. A reception followed. Is it your pleasure that I sign these minutes as a true and complete record? Thank you. We now come to the main business of today's meeting, which is to hear a paper, Grecian Doric's Return to the Central Mediterranean by David Boswell, FSA. Um, before I introduce our speaker, some housekeeping. There'll be a question and answer session at the end. We will be taking questions in the room and on Zoom and YouTube. If anyone would like to ask a question online, please type it in the chat function on Zoom or YouTube, and we will ask as many as we can at the end of the lecture. So um, David Boswell's paper, um, is um, Grecian Doric's return to the Central Mediterranean, Colonel, later General Sir George Whitmore's contribution with the Royal Engineers to the civil architecture of British Malta and the Ionian Islands in the early 19th century. Extremely interesting subject to which I think we are all much looking forward. Um, David studied history at Christ's College, Cambridge, followed by research in Zambia, and an MPhil at the LSE, and in Lancashire for a PhD at Manchester. He taught at the Open University for 30 years, with three at the University of Malta, establishing a new department of social studies. Since then, he's undertaken research in art and architectural history, resulting in a PhD from the University of York, with a thesis on the Kitson family of Leeds and their art and architecture in Sicily and the West Riding. Most recently, he has researched the architecture of General Whitmore of the Royal Engineers in Malta and Corfu, which has been published in the Georgian Group's journal. This lecture summarizes and updates this research. So without more ado, over to you, David Boswell. I won't repeat my uh, <laughs> introduction, which I was very ably delivered already. Um, and so I'll just refer initially to the research I did in these two publications uh, last year and the year before in the Georgian Group Journal <laughs> on the subject of tonight and a little more on Grecian Doric returning to in specifically Malta and the Ionian Islands, and the role of the Royal Engineers in really evicting the Baroque of the Knights of Malta and Venice. Secondly, is just to refer again to a published book um, by Michael Elul, attributing every work of Whitmore's except the Naval Hospital to an architectural teacher who came from Rome in 1800, Giorgio Pollicino, 
and was installed to teach architectural drawing at the university, which the British re-established after they'd taken over from the French. This persisted even after the third publication I want to mention, which is that of General Whitmore's own memoirs, which were largely published in a slightly edited form in 1982. This established very clearly what Whitmore had done. And in the case of the Ionian Islands, has been spectacularly written up and illustrated by a uh, Greek archaeologist and architectural historian, Dimakopoulos, um, for the palace and the, uh, the uh, basically wash house, the Maitland Memorial uh, on the Esplanade at Corfu, and a certain amount of other activities of Whitmore's, which are very well documented in the way that is not the case in much of his work in the Malta records. Whitmore is without name because it wasn't available until 1982 in his memoirs. But one of his achievements is actually recorded in Howard Colvin's reminiscences of his time off during the war when he went into the Garrison Library and found these great books of the Dilettante Society by Stuart and Rivette and Chandler and Rivette and so on, which greatly assisted Howard's switch over from ordinary history to architectural history. It was only, as I say, in 1982 that the Royal Engineer in question could be identified as Colonel, later General Whitmore. Whitmore was born in the, um, in the 18th century, and from 1789 uh, to 93, he was at the Royal Military Academy at Woolwich. And that's where Paul Sandby was teaching drawing, but not really architectural design at all. Um, and uh, then, uh, and there was no architectural design as such for the Royal Engineers, and not much in the way of construction. It was assumed they would learn on the job until 1810, when C.W. Pasley published his book. He'd been in Malta, incidentally, but returned just before Whitmore's appointment. And he introduced courses at Chatham on his return from Malta. Whitmore served in Gibraltar, and there he married the belle of the Mediterranean, Cordelia Ainsley. And subsequently, Malta, um, Whitmore had time in the West Indies, and he was in charge of the Eastern District, building Martello Towers in East Anglia and designing a new and um, uh, Greek Doric columned barracks for the Royal Engineers at Colchester, uh, uh, the Royal Artillery at Colchester. It seems that this was never built because many years later, the Royal Artillery was still in wooden buildings and I can't find evidence of there being anything more, but his designs uh, do exist in the um, National Archive. The Society of Dilettante, as I say, had published Chandler and Rivette's Antiquities of Ionia, followed by Stuart and Rivette's Antiquities of Athens, starting in the latter case in 1787. And the dilettante always had the intention of education, and Whitmore obviously took these up. In 1811 to 12, because it took time for him to actually arrive because his predecessor had not yet been paid off, 
he took command of the Royal Engineers in Malta and Governor Oakes, followed by Maitland in 1812-14, to 14, arranged for him to take charge of civil works for the British government in Malta and also after 1814 in the Ionian Islands. And he had an additional but limited financial allowance uh, to cover that. His first major work was reordering, oh, this is the barracks I referred to in uh, Colchester. His first major works was reordering and rearranging to what extent it had already existed, we don't know. The monument to Admiral Ball, the first commissioner in Malta after the British took Malta from the French, um, and he died in post. And there is this Grecian Doric temple-like structure with sculpture of um, virtues around it within the colonnade, the four-sided colonnade with statuary by the Maltese uh, sculptor de Mec. This is the plan of the building. And you can see the four niches in which the virtues were placed. It's in a little garden um, in Valletta. The next major building um, that uh, Whitmore undertook, again, for Governor Oakes, or Commissioner Oakes, to be precise, they were not governors until after the uh, treaty that ended the Napoleonic Wars, which ceded Malta to Britain. Prior to that, Malta was supposed to be handed back to Sicily and the Knights of Malta. And Whitmore designed the main guard, as it's called, which is onto the chancellery of the knights, opposite the Grand Master's palace that became the governor's residence. And there is correspondence which indicates very clearly how Whitmore was directly involved in the design because there are letters to him in the records in Malta. There are records from the Ordnance Board suggesting that he widens and deepens it uh, in order to allow more shade for the British guards who would be uh, on duty outside during a blazing Maltese summer sun. What is no longer apparent, but was originally, uh, first, this is still apparent. It wasn't for a little while because the Libyans covered it up when it was their cultural center. But this is the British coat of arms, of course, uh, with an inscription establishing the Maltese love for Europe and the Brits, Britannia, um, disputed nowadays by a number of Maltese, understandably. But what Whitmore did not do was destroy and remove the insignia of the previous Grand Masters of Malta for whom the building had been built. And you can see either side of the British arms, but step back on the original building, uh, those still surviving. This is the opposite of what the French usually did, which was to knock off the arms with a view, presumably, to putting the French in, but they were out of Malta and replaced by the British. And Whitmore was responsible for other British coats of arms than the ones that you see here in his humorous sketch of the host being processed into the great square beside the Grand Master's Palace and Library. Um, the, these other insignia and so on and trophies had now gone because they weathered away and were replaced in the 1860s and 1880s. Uh, so now you just have the British coat of arms, uh, but not those of the knights. But generally, the knight's arms survive. Whitmore himself and his large family lived in, and the British, of course, had this great legacy of buildings from the Knights of Malta. Um, he was housed in one of them, the House of Catalonia, um, on the Marsham Shet side of Malta with this great view across Emmanuel Island and uh, Gzira and what is now Slema. This is the St. Andrew's Bastion, and you can see the windmills 
And this was a sketch uh, by Whitmore himself. He lived just below the Auberge of Germany, where his uh, future um, brother-in-law and his daughter, who married, uh, <coughs> who married Whitmore's eldest son, and uh, they lived also in Malta. He, the eldest son was also a more junior royal engineer in, in the corps in Malta. And this is a drawing of the interior of one of the rooms, either by this in-law, the uh, Lord Chief Justice's daughter, uh, or by one of Whitmore's daughters, given her as a wedding present. It's not entirely clear from the inscription. And this was the sort of interior that Whitmore reckoned was good for the comfort and convenience of the British. Whitmore was also involved by Governor Oakes uh, in <clears throat> a considerable redesigning of the Manual Theatre, beautiful little theatre built by the Knights of Malta, um, still existing and still in activity. Uh, Whitmore added an extra tier of seating to the uh, theatre and amalgamated the three, and you see them here in red, uh, the three boxes for senior British officers taking time off from the Royal Navy or the Army. And he was um, made, he was appointed pro protetore of the theatre and was followed by that of another son-in-law, who Nugent, who was the controller of finance, who married another of Whitmore's daughters. So it's quite a family activity. 1812, and then from 1814, Lieutenant General Maitland was governor of Malta until 19, 1824. He'd been in Sri Lanka where he'd replaced Lord Guildford, not with a D, Guildford as of the family of Lord North, who lost the Americas. Um, next generation down, this there was ser a series of brothers who had no children, and this Lord North was a keen, uh, um, later Lord Guildford, who was a, a keen, um, very keen collector of books, founder of things, and so on, which we'll come across in Ionia. Maitland's secretary in Sri Lanka went on to other things, and he was in Malta uh, to introduce a new mode of bookkeeping for the colony and died there. He caught a disease and died. And Maitland asked Whitmore to design a memorial, and here you see um, a sort of Doric column topped with an urn. It's in the upper Baraka, which was a parade, um, recreational parade area for the Knights, and it still exists in this form. The British used the Baraka for monuments, and Whitmore was responsible as chairman of a committee for selecting um, a sculptor and designer for this memorial, a highly Roman memorial, to um, the Chief Justice Zamit, who was the first of the new British Order of St. Michael and St. George to die. And the lions are taken from plaster casts of Canova's lions for one of the uh, monuments to the popes in St. Peter's. 1814, but from 1800, uh, British, the Ionian Islands, which had moved from Venice to France to Russia to, to France and then to the British, uh, were made a protectorate. And you can see in this map how it's spread out along the entire western side of Greece, right down to the Peloponnese. 
And the two islands that I'm going to be mentioning in particular are Corfu at the top end near the Albanian border, and secondly, Kefalonia, which is the next largest island at much further down. That's what it looked like at the time the British took over and for the next 20 years or so. This great fortress in the, uh, set into the harbour and then a great glacis wasteland really um, kept clear and used as a parade ground with a little church that you can see. Now all this foreground part was actually where the palace and the later mansions were built. And Maitland's monument was later built uh, uh, towards what in the picture is the right-hand side of the esplanade. And it's still called the esplanade. The palace, um, which was built um, and finally formally inaugurated by Maitland, um, was finished in 1824. It's a complex set of buildings because originally, as planned, it was the palace for the Grand Master and the Knights of St. Michael and St. George. In Malta, the uh, old Grand Master's palace served its purpose perfectly well, but Corfu didn't have much, apart from a few churches, uh, didn't have much in the way of significant buildings. As originally designed, it would have had, and, uh, as it does, a great Doric colonnade across the uh, garden and formal esplanade front. But Maitland wanted to keep an eye on the uh, uh, legislative bodies that uh, were part of the Constitution. And so either side on the ground floor, which is what you see in the lower part of this plan, um, where the Senate and the legislative assembly rooms, and they had to be higher. So the whole thing gets higher and the Doric bases then have to be propped up on plinths, which complicated um, Whitmore's correct, otherwise correct designs. Further complications were on the, as you look at it, on the, le the left-hand side where the, um, the Venetian Monte de Pieta was a charitable banking institution which needed to be retained so that it was requiring access, which is through a triumphal Roman arch. And then there's a sort of annex built on the front with an inset pair of Doric columns. Above is the great suite of rooms uh, formerly for the night, the, uh, uh, the Knights of the Order, if you like, and also really for the Grand Master Maitland because there weren't many um, Ionian Knights. And then the guest rooms and the suite for the Grand Master lie behind on either side with a great uh, imperial staircase rising from the vestibule on the ground floor. Now, this is the frontage. And as originally designed, you would have had Britannia and a lion up in that ship. But in 1864, Greece became a state of its own and took over the Ionian Islands, and Britannia and lion have disappeared, leaving the prow of the Grecian ship. The sculptor of much of this was a more, uh, a, an Ionian uh, Greek, Crossolandis, and with Maltese sculptors, he designed both the ship at the top and also the group of reliefs that run along as a sort of frieze below with each of the Ionian islands on it. This is the triumphal arch that runs through to the uh, Monte de Pieta behind. And as you see, uh, this inset pair of Doric columns on a sort of pavilion on one side with a colonnade running round to it. And a similar one was then built on the other side, um, which led to the gardens 
behind the Grand Master's quarters. The vestibule is a great ionic building, and you can see what I was talking about if you look at the base of these columns, because it all had to be jacked up. But Whitmore was perfectly aware from Stuart and Rivette what column bases should be and what the proportions should be. So they just sort of hooked up in order to uh, get a better height. The history in the frieze is the painted history of, quite appropriately, Odysseus, who came from Ithaca, another of the islands. And then there's this grand staircase leading up. The Senate and the um, assembly bill, uh, rooms either side before you get to the staircase. And upstairs is this superb central rotunda lit originally by Vestal Virgins, which came from Canova's own studio in Rome. And either side of this are the throne room and the dining room. And this is really quite interesting um, artistically as well as architecturally because of what we see here. We've got uh, the paintings of St. Michael and St. George, which were carried out by a Maltese artist, uh, Caruana. We have fireplaces with caryatids of a sort, uh, figures either side carved by Proselendis, the professor of architecture. And in the ceiling, we have a set of insignia painted all the way around by an Italian, Signor Caccianiga, who was employed in Malta and who's recorded as employed to work on both the decoration of this palace in Corfu and secondly, the re-decorating, re let's put it that way, of the Grand Master's Great Hall, the Great Collegiate Hall um, in Malta. They are the sorts of insignia which are those of the order of St. Michael and St. George. And intriguingly, the plaster work must have been locally designed um, and it actually follows Dimacopolis found this, it follows um, similar work excavated in Corfu, the pattern. Academia took a great step forward during this British period and the Ionian Academy was founded by Lord Guildford. And here he is in a toga and a fancy headdress which caused some mirth in Corfu, uh, dressed as a sort of ancient Greek um, philosopher. Um, he created a superb library, which unfortunately his uh, descendants managed to extract from Malta. Um, but the Ionian Academy survived until the founding of the Greek state when they abolished it because they had a new one in Athens, and it was only refounded in much more recent day. And this statue is by Proselandis, the um, man I've referred to already. The academy is intriguing, and it impressed, Proselandis impressed Whitmore greatly, because he actually was offered a salary by Lord Guilford, when the, his school of sculpture was brought into the Ionian Academy, he refused it and wanted to purchase a set of casts of the Elgin marbles, the um, Parthenon marbles, which had just arrived in Britain and in the British Museum. George IV intervened and said that a set should be sent to the Ionian Academy in Corfu, as was done for various art schools in England, and I think also one in Rome. And it's an interesting thing that is not often recorded, that Britain provided a set of casts to the only Greek university in Greece. 
that then existed in Corfu. Now, no one knows where they are, and the museum in uh, Corfu has recently reopened, a very fine museum, but they have no idea where these casts may have got to, and I haven't found out. Memorial to Maitland was um, to take a different form originally. A lot of money was raised, like they did in Malta for Balls, Governor Balls Memorial, but they wanted a triumphal arch. Maitland wasn't having any of that. And in the end, what he proposed was a great colonnaded edifice to protect the main cistern on the Esplanade, already on the Esplanade at Malta, at uh, Corfu, and a sort of um, paved area sloping towards it within railings that would produce much purer water because it's all drainage water. It isn't a natural spring. This is the Ionic Colonnade with a text almost certainly by... Uh, uh, de, by uh, uh, Lord Guilford. But in the Ionian Islands, you do not only find Whitmore, Whitmore's Georgian uh, revival as Grecian Doric. You go to Kefalonia until 1955, when they were all destroyed in a colossal earthquake. There was, for a hundred years and a bit, a whole set of Grecian Doric revivals, in this case, by a royal engineer named Pitt Keithley. Now, this man was the engineer attached to the resident of, of Kefalonia, who was Colonel one of the many British colonels and admirals retired from the Napoleonic Wars. And he was to achieve fame later because he sent that great telegram, Pekavi, I have sinned when he was General Sir Charles Napier, whom you will see on the left-hand side of Trafalgar Square. So the interesting thing, I think, is that he was keenly in favor of the development of Kefalonia, but no great friend of the other body that was set up constitutionally consisting of representatives of the nobles and notables of each of the islands. So there were two parts, the British resident and the College of Notables. Um, this is another of those buildings. In this case, um, the public buildings at Lishuri, which included market, shops, courthouse, and a Lancastrian school. And if you don't know what a Lancastrian school is, this was an innovation of that period in Britain for providing a school system, usually within some great classical or modern hall, which divided the children into groups. And they had one major teacher, and then the older children taught the younger ones in small groups. That was the Lancastrian method expressed rather cruelly. And, uh, and rather crudely uh, by me. Again, you see the Grecian Doric, i.e. no base, Grecian Doric as different from Roman Truscan and so on, uh, building now gone thanks to the earthquake. And here is another, the uh, north front of the building erected at Argostoli, which was also to include a public school, assembly rooms, exchange, a small amateur theatre, and a Monte de Pietà. In this case, with an ionic portico. So 
th these are significant buildings, not tuppenny halfpenny extras like uh, the Ball Monument or the main guard in Malta, and in this case designed, as I say, by uh, the uh, Royal Engineer in the island under Sir Charles Napier. Napier was excluded from coming back after he'd taken his wife, who was very sick, to England because he and the High Commissioner who replaced Maitland, High Commissioner Adam, who was of the same family as Robert and all those other architectural Adams, and here he is by Proselandis in bronze outside the Corfu Palace. He had, his wife had died in Sicily. He was on the Sicilian and Spanish campaign, that southern um, campaign, not so well known as uh, Wellington's campaign. Um, and then his wife died there, and he was uh, the second of the commissioners. He was in charge of the army in the Ionian Islands and then became the uh, uh, high commissioner after Maitland had died in 1924, a few weeks after he'd inaugurated the Great Palace in Corfu. And he remained there until 1932-3 when he became governor of Madras and later retired to Florence. He married a... Um, uh, yeah, he, he, he married um, Nina Palatiano. They all had Italian name, Nina Palatiano, who was a noble woman of Corfu, and they adopted a Greek daughter. Uh, I suppose an orphan, someone else, but that's a different matter. And she became significant in Florence much later. This is how it, the whole esplanade looked when Whitmore had finished it. You can see the fort. The little church, which we saw on that earlier view of the Esplanade, and then how the palace looked before a lot of roads and so on were built. I don't think they're actually playing cricket on the green, but they do now, and they have done for a couple of centuries. During the time that the second High Commissioner of Corfu was responsible for activities, a very fine villa, now known as Mont Repos, but originally as the Casino, was built just above the ancient Greek site of Paleopolis, and it's where the Duke of Edinburgh was born. Our Duke of Edinburgh. It's not at all clear who designed the building. Whitmore, in his memoirs, praises Governor or the <clears throat> High Commissioner Adam for achieving and completing this fine villa. And he refers to the number of Doric villas and things he's designed for Maitland there, but which were never built. But it isn't actually stated by him that he did design the plan. But these are the sorts of little buildings which he records as garden buildings in the 1840s when he wrote a very fine treatise on different sizes and, and scales of villas and their grounds. The garden buildings are all there. The garden layout is all there. But unfortunately, none of the house plans are included in the treaties. I expect they were drawn bigger on another scale and they got lost. And it's interesting, I think, that in 1834, when Whitmore went back to Malta to oversee the building of... Uh, a um, big fortress on Vido Island, which had lost its money because the current uh, High Commissioner had refused to pass the funds over and there was a row with the Ordnance Board. He only had time to do two sketches, and this is one of them. 
and it shows the villa on the left and the old fort and so on, uh, of Corfu City beyond. So it's interesting that he only had time for two drawings, and this is one with the villa shown really prominently. It's an interesting plan, and I'll just make a few um, uh, sort of quotes, because in his treatise, he outlines some of the features of the first-class villa. And if you look at this, you will see that it follows those details. A first-class villa would have a portico before a vestibule, and the vestibule should rise to an oct through an octagon to um, a dome above. So if you look at the drawing on the right-hand side, the plan, you can see it, it's a little confusing because for some reason the portico has been built on the left when actually it should be on the right. But if you can transpose that, there's a portico into the square vestib vestibule and then into a central hallway that there should be direct access to the saloon, the drawing room and others, but maybe a library beyond. That is what we see if we look at the square central hall, the two major rooms either side, that the staircase should be set back, but that the height of the ground floor should be the same all the way through so that the bedroom floor is all level. There should be bay windows at either end of the great room. And on the bedroom level, there should be a separate access near the attic and servant's stair to the dressing room adjoining the bedrooms. All those features are on this. And I'll try and just summarize that. I'm not used to this. The portico, the vestibule, the hall with rising to this circular chamber hall above and a dome. The staircase set back and gradual, not very steep. And then on arriving at the top, you have a separate access up to the bedroom, up to the um, the closets, as he calls them, the dressing rooms associated with the main rooms. All this part is a later addition, whether during the uh, Duke of Edinburgh's time or beyond, I don't know. And then right at the top, you have the attic. There are the attic stairs, which we've seen on the way up, as it were, all the time. And they have a separate access. You don't have the main stairs going to the top. Now, all those he records in that sort of detail in his memoir um, uh, and also in the treatise on villa design. Now, it was written up later than his visit in 1834. So it's conceivable that he was so impressed that he took it all from here. But equally, it's quite possible that the basic plan was his. And the other drawings that do exist by uh, uh, Colonel Harper actually are building estimates. They're the costs. They're not the design for the building. And they don't exist in any form until much later. I'll just run through, and you can see Doric colonnade, bow windows and a colonnade uh, around the bow, the central square hall below, circular above, and this gradual staircase rising, not unlike the one at the Queen's house in Greenwich. A great gallery above the bedrooms, in, which actually light the attic rooms, and then the dome above. His greatest building was in Malta, 
apart from the palace in Corfu. His greatest building in Malta was the naval hospital. The site was a villa from the 1670s, the Villa Bigi, on a prominence overlooking the Grand Harbour on the eastern side. And the commissioner, the first commissioner, um, and a naval surgeon recommended the site to Nelson, at that time still alive, um, to Nelson as a site for the naval hospital. Now, nothing much happened for 20 odd years because the site, other sites, there were so many, there were prisons of the knights, there were other buildings of the knights, and these were used. It was much cheaper to use existing buildings. But after the Battle of Navarino, the CNC Codrington came back with his wounded men and there was nowhere decent to put them. They were put in an old gunnery fort on the extremity of uh, the Grand Harbour. And Whitmore had already designed the hospital, but it kept getting shelved. Now it was built. And he was about to leave Malta. His term of office ended in 1829. This was what he planned. And this is the original model presented, we assume, to the Admiralty at the time. There are two great stoa-like wards very well ventilated. He had advice, no doubt, from a health point of view. And then the medical and officers' wards were in the old villa in the middle. And the site was to be leveled because it's on a rising ground. The site would be leveled so that you would have the correct Greek proportions below the in the style of it in the basement. Well, that's what was planned. That's a plan of Whitmore's wards. And you can see the colonnade either side of what I'm calling a stoa-like building. The colonnade is open to the wards. So this whole idea of fresh air is very much present years before um, Florence Nightingale. But the Admiralty refused architecture and actually sent out an express um, order that architecture was not to be expressed. So the hill, it was really saving money on the hill, you see, that wasn't going to be uh, uh, demolished to great, create this great corps d'honneur. And as a result, um, a bridge has been put across to reach the officers' wards from the entrance. Uh, the Baroque was plastered over and a Neo-Grecian building resulted from, Malta's, from Whitmore's design. And in the 1980s, 90s, and then when a lot of restoration was done, it's now actually the um, cultural, uh, uh, the cultural headquarters of the government of Malta. Uh, these um, little pieces of the Baroque villa were unveiled, and as a sort of architectural palimpsest, they've now been left revealed. So you have a baroque building, de baroque and now slightly baroque again. But that's what was actually designed, and that's how you see it. And actually, when Whitmore, who'd been so disappointed with the Admiralty's remarks and uh, the disdainful way he was treated when he returned, uh, when he actually went out in 1834, he was delighted to see what had actually eventuated on the great front to the Grand Harbour. That's a, a lithograph by Belanti, one of the later uh, professors and directors of the School of Art in Malta in the early 1840s. I mentioned uh, Katjaniga 
And maybe he was responsible for this complete redecorating, which transformed that great hall of the Knights of Malta in the Grand Master's Palace from a commemoration of the siege of 1565 to being um, a neoclassical ballroom and throne room for the order. And that's how it existed until Edward VII got there and recommended that uh, it should now be uh, this um, sort of temporary stuff. It's all paint, it's not real plaster, that it should all come down. But this is Whitmore's design, or a, may well be Whitmore's design, and it's recorded by Bro von Brockdorf in 1819-20. to 20. So well in the period that one would expect Whitmore to be working on. He may well also have designed for his uh, brother-in-law, the uh, Lord Chief Justice, the Admiralty Court, which Stoddart had originally been responsible for. And this is a view by uh, Brockdorf of the court in session. And Whitmore certainly designed, because this is his drawing of uh, the upper Baraka, where we saw those memorials early on as um, rearranged as a great sort of garden party and recreational space with a band in the middle and fountain and so on. Whitmore was not, as we've seen in the case of Kefalonia, the only uh, person who was uh, enthusiastic about reviving Grecian Doric and Grecian architecture. Um, a retired diplomat, um, Hookham Frere, retired with his wife, the Duchess of uh, Countess of Errol, to Malta and lived in a, uh, in a big house in Valletta and also had a fine garden villa at, at Pietà, just outside the walls. Now, his brother was a justice and the first master of Downing College, Cambridge, which, as I'm sure you'll be aware of, was the great innovation of Grecian Doric and other aspects of Grecian architecture by William Wilkins, the designer of the National Gallery. He designed Downing College. And the brother, uh, Hook and Frere's brother, and Hook and Frere designed this sarcophagus-like um, tomb for the Countess of Errol, uh, Hook and Frere's wife when she died, and then later Hook and Frere was added. And Hook and Frere uh, designed it, and his brother um, made the, in, the inscription uh, to stand on it. And later, when Hook and Frere died, he went into it, and then a similar one was designed for his sister, who had also been with him, an unmarried sister who died also in Malta. Other monuments exist in this British cemetery. This also designed and now restored by Hook and Frere, and it's a design, a memorial, to the founder of British Freemasonry in Malta. And Hook and Frere, just after Whitmore had left, had his garden superbly terraced, carved, canaled, and at the top, a Grecian Doric gazebo with a great view of the harbor. Sadly, he does not record the name of the architect or the sculpture, which has left it open, of course, to be offered to all and sundry. I'm not saying that it was designed by Whitmore. I don't know. But it could have been, because Whitmore was one of a circle that used to meet, have dinner, chat, and so on uh, at Hook and Frere's villa, which included this, uh, the brother of Sir Humphrey Davy, who was researching, uh, he was a doctor researching in the military hospital, and it included a number of the Italian refugees from the restored reactionary regimes in southern Italy, including uh, Rossetti's father. And it was with them that Whitmore organized uh, 
a catch for a man named Grenier de Vas, who was perpetrating new manufactured artifacts and selling them as uh, to the Brits, the unsuspecting Brits, as uh, memorials from uh, um, Neolithic, or as they thought of it, Phoenician, uh, uh, ancient Malta. Uh, this is Policino, um, taught from 1800 to 1830-odd at the university, architectural history and geometrical drawing. And this is the only neoclassical design of his which is known. Hookham Frere had been made uh, uh, governor or chairman or whatever of the university committee and was anxious for the university to be rather up, upstaged a bit over the School of Art and the Lyceum Grammar School with which it was housed in the old uh, Jesuit buildings. So a new design doorway was built for the university on the opposite side in St. Paul Street. And that's, um, and it's really the lower picture that is relevant here. That was Policino's design. And this is the design which is attributed by the university secretary, who surely knew what he was writing, to Whitmore. Um, not surprisingly, both are Grecian Doric gateways of the sort. One of them, this one, of course, with the British arms and uh, a quite different um, design at the top by Pulicino, who in the 1830s was a keen supporter of Maltese legislative uh, um, democratic developments, which did not take place for another 150 years. Other monuments of a neoclassical kind are found in Malta, um, and some of them are in the same place as we've seen others, but this one to the second governor of Malta, Lord Hastings, who had retired sick from Calcutta, the East India Company, and brought with him a sort of vice regal court approach, and he died in 1826 after only two years. More, Whitmore offered to design his tomb, but his widow declined. And it was actually designed in England some years later and didn't come out until 1848. Um, and it shows um, Hastings in a senatorial uh, garb. It was exhibited at the Royal Academy before it came out. And it's within a court, uh, a, a sort of court-like uh, um, sort of temple uh, come tomb. Uh, it's a, by, supposedly by an architectural historian of some repute, um, uh, James Ferguson. I haven't seen the documentation for it, and I don't know on what that is based. But the design of the architecture is quite different. Uh, in uh, origin and person from the design of the memorial itself. Another design, this time inside the, um, the upper Baraka where we saw the earlier monuments, is this one to another naval man who died in post as CNC, Admiral Houghton. And in this case, um, the deputy governor who, who was appointed after the um, death of uh, Lord Hastings, was obviously without Whitmore. He wanted Whitmore to stay, but that wasn't permitted by the Ordnance Board. So instead, he got a model bust made by uh, Cahia, one of the uh, sculptors that had been um, used very much by Whitmore. Um, he got him to design the bust, and the um, Rittler the uh, Admiralty Wittler, who was something of an artist, designed the shipping scene, which you can see below on the chippers. And the whole lot was sent over to Hubert Thorvaldsen in Rome. And Thorvaldsen um, basically approved it and got the bust sculpted by a man named Bilovsky, who I assume was working in his studio 
and then the whole lot came back in the admiral's in the governor's barge and was erected uh, in the Baraka. The Brits had been anxious for many years to have their own Church of England. They were camping out, as it were, or camping in the ground floor of the Grand Master's Palace, the uh, Governor's Palace. Now, when Whitmore left, despite the successful building by the artificers of the sappers and miners who were working in the civil works uh, with Whitmore, despite their success in getting the Royal Naval Hospital built, none of them were appointed to take charge. But there was a gash man, sort of gash Brit with skills around. He'd been brought out as a, as a master joiner to design furniture for the governor, the governor's residences. And he was available, the governor was dead, Hastings had died, so he was around. So he was put in charge at just the time major buildings in Malta for the first time started to be built by the British. One of them was the Church of England here, St. Paul's, and another was the prison, and there were others. He had no architectural and particularly no masonry knowledge and skills. The artificers were fed up and they weren't going to help him. So the design, as you see, started falling down when the entablature was reached just above the columns. Fortunately for Malta and the Brits, who um, were highly embarrassed by this major disaster, in Malta to design the first dry dock was William Scamp. Straight, not quite straight, but very soon after he'd been clerk of works for Wyatt at Windsor. So someone who knew his buildings and design. And he got moving. It was called an absolute embarrassment. And uh, the Whitler said he'd never seen, uh, that Scamp said he'd never seen anything so ignorant as Lancashire's building. Lancashire died um, while this was going on, probably drowned himself. But he's in another of those neo grecian sarcophagi. Uh, but this is the building designed by Scamp with, as you can see, a completely separate spire on its own foundations, not perched above the colonnade. Whitmore had designed an eight columned portico earlier, but that had fallen foul of bad foundations. It had never, uh, it had been proved too costly and uh, the ordnance board uh, refused. Uh, but uh, by the time this came along, um, the Dowager Queen uh, of uh, William IV was cruising through a, a convalescent and she paid for both the one that fell down and for this. And it was one of the major classical, but much more Gibbsian, much more British uh, than Grecian designs uh, from in Malta. And the last of the obvious Grecian Doric buildings is this exedra built in a much earlier um, fountain courtyard of the barracks below St. Elmo. There's a great cistern up above it providing water, and it was the ablution block for the troops. And there's a shelving where they could put their clothing and so on or around inside. Um, there are no drawings for it architecturally. There is a drawing that shows where it was to be that seems to date from about 1836, i.e seven years after Widmore had left. Now, there's no reason why Pollicino should have had anything to do with it. He had no employment in the Royal Engineers. The artificers could well have followed the sort of uh, Grecian Doric designs that Whitmore had 
uh, paid so much attention to, or it could have been left over for ordnance board funding at a later date, having originally been put forward by Whitmore. Now we don't, uh, so far, no evidence that has turned up to show what may have uh, actually been the case. But after that, the buildings don't take the same form. Policino designed three churches in a more or less Renaissance come um, Baroque style, um, none of which won commissions. And he had qualified formally as one of the 12 Periti of Malta uh, in 1830 just before he retired from the School of Art. And the Lieutenant Governor Ponsonby commissioned him to design this Romano-Egyptian obelisk in memory of Ponsonby's cousin, um, a naval peer named, or peer's son named Spencer, member of the family that we're well aware of at Altrop. And this is another of Belanti's uh, views. The monument was used very much to come in and out of Malta as a great landmark. But uh, because it was such a landmark, when war came along of a different kind, uh, something so prominent was embarrassing and it was moved and it's now uh, in a rather lower position just outside Floriana. This is one of... Um, Policino's architectural designs. And I think you can see why I called it a sort of Renaissance Baroque building with these multiple uh, features, the pediments and extra pediments on top of pediments and so on. Um, nothing like Whitmore's designs. That, however, was how the engineers finished off well after Whitmore had left in the 1840s um, with this very sub-classical chapel, which is then became a post office, and I'm not sure what it is now. It's in Castile Square, very prominent position, just in front of the Baraka Malta. But interestingly, in Corfu, Neo-Doric continues, Grecian Doric, this great chapel for the British battalion at, uh, on the old fort. It seems not to be known who designed it. Whitmore had certainly well gone, but there was an up and coming Greek architect, John or Johannes Cronis. Now, I've never seen him so far associated with this building, but this is one of his buildings uh, he was a protege of um, High Commissioner Adam, who uh, arranged for him to have an exhibition in the palace of his work. And uh, this is the Ionian Bank, which was founded as a way of relieving locals of the terrible loans that the local nobility used to give them. And this is his parliamentary building for uh, when they move the parliament out of uh, uh, the palace. He designed a number of great mansions along the front near the royal palace, near the uh, what became the royal palace after the union with Greece. Uh, this one for the Capodistrio family, the first president of the new Greece. And more normally, this sort of arcaded building of apartments, which actually follows a principle and fashion set up on the list on, on the, the side of the front of the esplanade by the father of the uh, Suez Canal, his father, de Lesseps' pair, designed this during the French period in 1870. That's the list on of the lessons. Whitmore um, 
got what he had hoped for. Um, he'd finished abroad, and both the High Commissioner Adam and Vice Governor Ponsonby lobbied for him to get an honour. He was no longer in Malta or the Ionian Islands, so they managed to get him a uh, membership uh, of the, or knighthood, of the Royal Welfare or Hanoverian Order. Of course, that died out with Victoria, but he, he felt he was now somebody. He, he had gained face because he felt all these generals and everybody who had all these titles and so on, he had nothing. So he was very pleased. Um, he became the, uh, for 15 years, first as deputy and then as commandant of the Royal Military Academy at Woolwich, which is now flats and so on, which had been designed by James Wyatt. And he lived himself nearby um, on the, uh, the other side of Woolwich Common at Charlton. And just one reference, which I think is worth making, his interest in archaeology itself. He was interested and went to various sites in Malta, but when a spring burst and partly destroyed and revealed the Kadaki temple, Doric temple, above Morapo in Corfu, he was responsible for what we would call rescue archaeology, and subsequently the German architect Dorfeld, working mainly for um, the Kaiser, was responsible for a more extensive scholarly excavation, but Whitmore actually corresponded with Rivet and provided an article which Rivet edited and used in his extension in 1830 of uh, Stuart and Rivet's Antiquities of Athens. And this, interestingly, but not because of Whitmore, is now thought to be the earliest Doric capital in Greece itself excavated, I think, by Dorkfeld, and now on view yet again after 10 years or more closure of the museum in Corfu. Well, that, I think, is an appropriate place to stop, and I'd be very happy to answer questions. Thank you very much for that. Very interesting lecture. I think we might have time for a couple of questions, if there are any in the room here. <coughs> Thank you, David. Absolutely fascinating and beautifully illustrated. <coughs> Obviously, you had very um, <coughs> the officer of the Royal Engineers designing it. Um, <coughs> Was he entirely dependent on local labour? Did he have uh, squads of other officers of the Royal Engineers supervising things? Um, how did that work? No squads of other officers. Uh, for the palace in Corfu, uh, he actually refers to his staff consisted of one sergeant, oh, sorry, uh, one sergeant. Um, of the uh, Royal Engineers as clerk of works, one Maltese stonemason, probably Kakia, who did not understand plans, he was a sculptor mason, and himself, who was locally nicknamed the Colonel of the Fortezza, a palazzo. So, um, not, not many. And in Malta, the artificers, the sappers and miners, were Maltese, and the system was, as far as I can make out, was Whitmore would provide the initial drawings and they'd be sent to the Ordnance Board, but when the approval was given, one of the artificers, one of the seniors, would be actually paid to produce scale drawings, which I Or 
I think we have one question online. Have you come across any details or lists of works carried out at the Magistral Palace in Malta by Sir Whitmore? Anything in the palace by Whitmore? Uh, any details or lists of works carried out at the Magistral Palace? Uh, there's one which was the drawing I showed where they effectively, I presume, put up canvas on wooden frames and a fake plaster ceiling to convert the uh, representation of the great siege of 1565 from the knights to a British ballroom interior. Um, otherwise, I don't know of other work except possibly the uh, Admiralty Court, which seems to date from the right period and would have been designed for Whitmore's brother-in-law. Um, so one could speculate a connection but there isn't enough that I have seen so far to indicate that he did design it, but it seems likely. But what one needs to do all the time is appreciate that the carrying out of the designs is by almost always by other people, the diff especially in Malta where they did have the staff. And it's worth noting that because a question someone did ask uh, me on another occasion was, what did the Maltese think of this uh, colonial coming in and changing their architecture? Well, of course, the Maltese had been used for several hundred years to Italian, French, Netherlands, all sorts of colonials uh, in the sense of staff of the Knights of Malta who were not Maltese and some Maltese, and a lot of uh, manual work done by the Maltese. Secondly, by this time, the fashion architecturally and artistically had changed dramatically. And the, the, there is an Italian, Viennese Italian version of what we think of as pre-Raphaelite novelty, well established by the 1830s in Rome by Overbeck and Minardi and others. And the Maltese artists, I'm not talking about architects now, the Maltese artists are following that fashion, uh, pre-Raphaelite and even pre uh, and even Raphaelite revival. And think of this other stuff as uh, pagan, Voltairianism, they call it. Um, so in no way are the Maltese enthusiasts for the old Baroque, except possibly people like Polluccino and the church. Well, I think that's a very good moment on which to um, offer you a round of applause for that most fascinating and wide-ranging presentation, David. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I hope you'll all stay for the sherry, um, and I'm sure there will be more questions during the, during the sherry. Um, but I give notice that the next meeting will be the Out of London meeting in York on Thursday, the 23rd of November, 2023, at 5.30pm. And we will hear a paper, Boynton Hall Simply Told, by Dr. Adrian Green, FSA. The meeting stands adjourned. And don't forget that our spring events program is available on our website and that events are free to all. Thank you all.